Hello, Terry. Um, Hi. Thank you for talking to Dark Matter. Um, you took over the role of Davros in Doctor Who. What was it like stepping into someone else's shoes? Uh, well, stepping into someone else's chariot, actually, because uh, you know, Davros hasn't got any bottom part. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I'd, I didn't actually know anything about Davros when I did it. Uh, I'd watched Doctor Who as, you know, in the early years with uh, Hartnell and Troughton, but I kind of drifted away um, just before Tom Baker. And so I knew about the Daleks, but I didn't really know much about Davros. So when Matthew asked if I would be interested in taking this character on, um, I had to go and sit down with him and watch uh, Genesis uh, to get an idea of what the character was and, and what they were trying to do with it. Um, so, it, yeah, I, th I thought, you know, I, th I looked on it as a fascinating experiment in recreating something which is a character that's very much created through the voice. Because, certainly in those days, I mean, it's a lot different now with the prosthetics, but they had a mask which was virtually immobile, you know, and you were in a you were bolted into a chair, so nothing much moved at all, except forward and back, and you know, your mouth. So you were having to create the character vocally. And for me, that was always something I've always enjoyed doing, because I've done a lot of radio. Um, so working in a mask was a bit like doing radio on TV, you know, because you're having to vocally create the character. So for me, that was the major challenge, and, and also the uh, thing that intrigued me too. Um, you watched video of the original Davros in order to prepare for the role. Mm. So, what was it like um, acquiring this this voice, this character? Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I watched what Michael was doing and, and try to work out how he how he created it. But actually, a lot of it really came into focus and was sort of informed when I actually got to wear the mask. Because the mask is foam latex and was very stiff and unyielding and you had to work your mouth really hard to get any kind of movement on the outside of the mask. So immediately by having to talk in a very particular way, you're creating a rhythm to the voice which starts to become that kind of jerky rhythm that Davros has and then just literally start to bring, bring the voice down in tone and put a bit of psychosis into it and before you know where you are, Davros has appeared and the doctor must be exterminated. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and you've, you've done a lot of work for um, radio, for the BBC, for Big Finish Productions. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I started in radio back in about 1972, um, um, having done a lot of rep work and stuff like that, and uh, I was then offered a, a job on the Archers for five weeks, and the Archers, you know, being, well, the longest running serial, you know, radio serial in the, in the world, you know, it's been going since 1951. Um, uh, so I've now been in it nearly 40 years. Uh, so, yeah, for me, radio was always the thing I liked doing most. Um, because for an actor, it provides challenges, but it also provides opportunities that you don't get in other areas of work. Um, because on radio, I can, I can be things that physically I could never be on stage or on film or television. You know, I can be a, you know, still I can be a sort of 25 year old, you know, punk or somebody who's six foot four with rippling muscles and flashing teeth, which I can't be, obviously in real life, uh, or play an older man or somebody from a different ethnic uh, background, whatever. Uh, so it provides lots of challenges and in a sense the actor's got the most control over that than any other media because it is you and the microphone and it's you creating the picture in the audience's mind and there's not a lot anybody can do to get in the way of that. On stage, focus can be pulled by the way they light it, by the way they dress it, um, in television it's how the, they decide to shoot it and then how they decide to cut it. So you don't have that level of control. Um, you don't obviously have full control in the radio, but it's mainly your voice that is going to be used to create that picture. So that's, as an actor, I find it extremely satisfying. Mm -hmm. What's been your favourite role? Uh, my favourite role of all time. My favourite role of all time was playing Arturo Ui in The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui which is the uh, Brecht play, <coughs> which uh, it mirrors Hitler's rise to fame. And in fact, everybody in the play looks like the characters from real life. Arturo Ui is Hitler, but it's set in Chicago and they're gangsters in the 20s. Um, but it's set against the real life things that happen. 
Um, it's a very strong political piece, but um, I love doing that. And, um, and Lenin Rossiter, who's one of my you know, heroes as an actor, I saw him do it as, with a Berliner ensemble playing Uwe, and he was staggeringly good. I just really, you know, that's been my favourite. That was, that's a role, the one-off role that I've done. I've thoroughly enjoyed doing Davros over the years, very much so. And exploring the character and, and building on it and extending it, as we've done with the big Finnish audios, you know, with I, Davros and, and, uh, and all the others, you know. Um, uh, but, uh, no, that one as a, a one as a stage piece, that's the one that's always stood out as one that I really enjoyed. And I'd love to have done again, uh, because when I did it, I was much younger. And I, I'd love to have done it when I was closer to the age, but I haven't have gone past that now, but, uh, sadly. Yeah. Um, your bio says that uh, you tour around Doctor Who conventions talking about your time working on the series. Is there one anecdote that is particularly memorable? <coughs> on, on the series? Mm. Working on Doctor Who? <coughs> um, there are quite a few. I mean, there's. I mean, Colin and I uh, played around a lot when we were doing Revelation. <coughs> and there was. Um, a moment when Davros's hand was shot off, his fingers, you know, and they all went splat. And then there was a reaction shot of the Doctor as it had happened. So they did the, the blow off of the fingers bit, you know, and me sort of, you know, reacting. And then when they reset the thing, what they hadn't noticed was that Colin had picked up one of the fingers. And when they came to do the take, it was sticking up his nose. Now, obviously they didn't use that take, but you know, it was things like that, those little games we used to play with each other. And uh, you know, and I'd say, he's the doctor, and he'd go, who? You know, and, uh, and when he was about to go, you know, he'd put his hand out to shake goodbye, and I'd go and realise I'd got no hand, so how can I shake, you know. Uh, uh, lots of little things like that, but um, uh, yeah, it was, it was good fun, and there was always fun to work with, you know, on. Um, some tellies can be fairly boring or stressed, but Doctor Who, all for me, always seemed to be great fun. Mm. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed times in the studio. And I enjoy it even more now that we do it uh, on the audio because, you know, obviously you don't have to get into all, the, uh, all that gear and uh, suffer all that physical discomfort. Yes. What was it like being Russell, the undercover policeman, in the attack of the Cybermen? Oh, that was, that was good. It was nice. Uh, cause Matthew asked if I'd like to be a real person for once. And I thought, yeah, okay, yeah, it'd be good. And working with Maurice Colburn uh, was fabulous, you know, because I'd, I'd been with him in, in Resurrection. And he was, such the, he was so much the nicest man. He always played really heavy villains. He did a series called Gangsters in the UK. I don't know if people remember that, but where he played a fairly tough, you know, brummy villain. And... Um, uh, but he was so nice. He was uh, just the nicest man you could possibly want. He'd quietly go off and do some fishing, you know, when he'd finished with, with things. And um, he thoroughly enjoyed himself, and, and I, I loved it with him. And playing Russell was great fun because it, it was, I was playing with um, with Colin, and, I, and that was the first time I met Colin. So obviously we brought a lot of that. To, but then when we did Revelation, you know, we'd had a fair amount of fun on uh, on uh, uh, Cyberman thing. Um, but in, interesting, I was, I was killed at the end of the first episode, you know, um, and it created one of these problems for the, uh, the BBC and, and they had to sort of solve it by giving the TARDIS a self-cleaning circuit. So if you watch the end of the first episode, I die and I'm on the floor of the TARDIS. When they rerun the end of the first episode in the second episode, there is no body. It's gone. The TARDIS has cleaned it away because the BBC Accounts Department said it had to. Because if it hadn't, they'd have had to pay me another fee for being there in shot. So, class piece of work. Um, what, what is your favourite, like, Doctor Who story? Uh, well, of all of them ever. Mm. Um, I, still, I, I like a lot of the new, the new series, mm. very much so. I love Dalek. Uh, when the first one came back. I mean, the, the, I think Rob Sherman did a brilliant job in that. And Eccleston, the look on Eccleston's face when he saw that Dalek was so good. It was the doctor with fear in his eyes, which is as it should have been at that moment. And it was excellent, really excellent. A lot of that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, Gosh, there are so many actually. There's such a lot of little moments. Some of them are episodes, some of them are moments. You know, I, lo I loved uh, the one with the maggots, 
you know. Um, John Pertwee. Yeah, yeah, John Pertwee. Um, I had a lot of fun with the, with the early days of Troughton. And I do love Matt Smith. I think he's fantastic. Mm. He, he is an alien, as far as I'm concerned. He is 900 years old and he is an alien. And he reminds me so much of, of, um, of Troughton, you know, that mm. uh, I thoroughly, I, you know, I love him. There's so many, I mean, a lot of the new stuff, a lot of Steve Moffat stuff, which I love because they're very dark and quite unfinished. Mm. You know, we, uh, Blink and the Angels and all of that. Great, great new monsters, you know, because you can spend a lot too much time with the old monsters. You've got to create new ones mm. and, and keep them going. I mean, the Daleks here, yeah, they're iconic. They'll constantly keep coming back because they're, they're there in the background all the time. They are, you know, the Doctor's main nemesis, really. And Davros sometimes along with that. But uh, um, there's lots of new monsters coming through, which is great and it's good to see. Mm. Is there any particular role on stage or screen that you would like to play that you haven't played yet? Uh, there's one part I've always wanted to play and I can never play now, and that is um, Edmund in King Lear. Uh, for me, I mean, it was, it was a play I've loved all my life. I studied it for A level when I was a kid. I studied at university. I've, you know, I've never been in it, but I've, I've been to a lot of productions of it. And Edmund is a character I've always wanted to play because I think there's a hell of a lot of humour in him which sometimes doesn't always come out in his attitude to the stars and forecasting and things like that. And um, I think he's just a brilliant constructed, brilliantly constructed character. But sadly I'm too old to play him now. So, um, but uh, that's one I'd always wanted to play, but sadly no more. One fan asked, how many people mistake you for Captain Pike? Ah, oh, stupid boy. Um, <laughs> not many, actually. Um, I very nearly... Um, uh, Captain Mannering, you mean? Uh, he said Captain Pike, so... Yeah, well, it would be Captain Mannering from Dad's Army, who his, his classic phrase was when they were being held up by a German U-boat commander and he wants to know everyone's name. And, uh, and he points to, 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 to Pike, Private Pike. He says, and what's your name? And Mannering says, don't tell him, Pike. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's just one of those classic moments on Dad's Army. And I very nearly played Mannering on a tour, uh, but something else got in the way, so well, I, I didn't. But um, yeah, I, I, I sort of, you know, it was either, it's not so much Pike, it's more probably Eric Clapton is the one that a lot of people go for. Yes, there was a, a play off on you looking like Eric Clapton, and then you actually played Eric Clapton. Would you like to tell us about that? That was that came out of an episode of Casualty, which I did, <coughs> where I was, I, you know, I've been a, I've been a Clapton fan all my life. I was a you know, fanboy for Clapton. I mean, I, I was at one of the last concerts that Cream did, and um, I'd never had seen any resemblance between me and Clapton at all. But I did this episode of Casualty, and then my agent rang up on the Monday, or following the Saturday, and said, "We've just had Harry Hill on the on on the phone, and they want to use you." Um, uh, at the end of the show, at the end of the week, because they think you look like Eric Clapton. And they do this thing where, you know, what famous stars have been in soaps this week, you know. And this one was Eric Clapton in Casualty. So they actually had me at the very end, in a hospital gown, with a drip, playing Layla and segueing into, into the Casualty theme song, which was, <laughs> was just as ridiculous. But my street cred with my kids went through the roof. You know, suddenly I was like, wow, you know, you are famous. Because they, they, you know, Davros, yeah, so what, you know. But no, hey, Harry Hill, you are really, you know, you, you've really done it now. Yeah. What do you plan to talk about in your appearances at Armageddon this weekend? No idea. I never plan anything ahead. I, I take it as the, as the moment, you know, arises. You know, I'll take it from questions or, you know. <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's lots I can talk about. And in fact, sometimes I take things so much as read by fans that I don't talk about Doctor Who at all. And in fact, when Colin and I get together, we've done stuff where people say, oh, well, we'll interview you. say, no, don't bother, we'll interview each other. And we've spent, you know, 45 minutes, an hour on stage talking about anything but Doctor Who. And funnily enough, a lot of the fans find that fascinating mm -hmm. because it's an insight into other areas of our life which they don't normally see or touch. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for us, Doctor Who is just a part of it. Mm -hmm. A very important part, no doubt. But it's just a part of our, our other life. And the things that make us who we are are 
there are other stimulus and other work that we've done and other things in our family lives and our n normal life, you know, um, in the UK or wherever we go if we're abroad. Um, that can sometimes be fascinating and touch people's lives and say, oh yeah, I recognise that. So, yeah, I don't know. I never plan anything. It's pointless because otherwise you, you know, you get a curveball thrown and you think, oh, hang on, that's not in the script, you know. So I always go improvised. Well, thank you very much for talking to Dark Matter. My pleasure. I hope you have a great weekend. Looking forward to it very much.